Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, what is analytic psychology? So analytic psychology is a theory that was developed by Carl Jung, and sometimes we refer to it as analytic therapy. Carl Jung was a colleague of Freud, and he broke with Freud over his vision of personality theory and his vision of what caused and maintained symptoms. Specifically, they broke over the idea of the collective unconscious, and I'll get to that in a moment. So analytic psychology is a complex therapy, and it has a number of parts that are fairly unconventional when we compare them to other popular theories, like cognitive behavioral therapy, reality therapy, existential therapy. All of those different modalities have things that are a little different between them, but there are a lot of similarities. Analytic psychology or analytic therapy really stands out as being quite a bit different. So if we look at psychoanalytic therapy and we compare it to analytic therapy, we can see that a lot of the language, a lot of the terms are similar, but there are different meanings. For example, when we consider the ego, Carl Jung looked at the ego as how one sees oneself. He also looked at the ego as self-regulating. This is quite a bit different than how the ego was viewed by Freud. Freud looked at the ego as mediating the id, basic drives and urges, and the superego, which we could call morality, the social norms, the rules that we feel we have to follow because of pressure from society. Carl Jung also had levels of consciousness. He had the conscious mind, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious, whereas Freud had the conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious. So when we look at the conscious mind, the way Carl Jung envisioned the conscious mind was fairly similar to how Freud viewed it. Conscious awareness is what we're thinking of right now, and Carl Jung believed that the conscious mind was the gatekeeper to consciousness. The personal unconscious is a little different than what we see with the, for example, with the subconscious with Freud. The personal unconscious had thoughts, ideas, memories that were repressed or forgotten. If we look at the subconscious of Freud, these were items that are retrievable, but just not in conscious awareness. So a bit of a difference there between the subconscious that Freud had and the personal unconscious of Carl Jung. The largest difference, however, is with the collective unconscious. If we look at the unconscious mind that we see with Freud, that's where urges and drives that are unacceptable are stored. And the unconscious stores more material than the conscious and the subconscious combined. The collective unconscious we see with Carl Jung is quite a bit different. It has concepts that are shared across generations. Now, Carl Jung didn't believe that the collective unconscious was inherited, but rather shared. He did believe, however, that there was a predisposition to have certain types of what he referred to as the archetype. And this predisposition was inherited. So the collective unconscious is shared by all people, but not inherited, but the predisposition to have certain archetypes is inherited. This, as I mentioned, was one of the main reasons why Freud and Jung broke, and Jung went into a different direction. There were more beliefs that they differed on, but the collective unconscious was a major part of this. Freud essentially didn't believe that the collective unconscious existed at all, at least not in the form that Carl Jung did. And for Carl Jung, the collective unconscious wasn't just another part of his theory, it was a critical part of his theory. So I mentioned before this idea of the archetype. And this is also an important element of Jungian therapy, of analytic psychology. There are actually many, many archetypes, but there are a few that are emphasized in his writings. We have the persona. This is a mask, essentially, that people put on. So it's a way they want to appear to other people. There's the anima, which is the feminine part of a male, of the male psyche. And the animus, which is a masculine part, of the feminine psyche. And he also emphasized the role of the shadow and the self. The shadow contains really unacceptable drives, a darker side of personality, similar to what we see with Freud in the unconscious mind. And the self, 
really gives meaning and purpose and cohesion to the psyche. As a matter of fact, one of the goals of Jungian therapy is to have the ego appropriately relate to the self. So the self is really the archetype of wholeness. Another goal of Jungian therapy is to take unconscious material and integrate it into the conscious mind. So this goal, very similar to what we see with Freudian therapy, with psychoanalytic therapy. So Jungian therapy is a particularly complex therapy. It does have some concrete techniques, but even some of these concrete techniques are fairly complex. So we see here with the techniques of Jungian therapy, we have free association, dream analysis. Dream analysis is actually a major part of Jungian therapy. Catharsis, the use of art like poetry and music, word association, and the interpretation of transference. This interpretation of transference, fairly similar to what Freud did. The dream analysis isn't really the same as what Freud did. With Carl Jung, the dream analysis was really about understanding the symbols. So he viewed dreams as fairly straightforward representations of what was going on in the collective unconscious or the personal unconscious. He didn't see dreams as really mysterious, except that the symbols in dreams needed to be interpreted. Freud saw the dreams as concealing inappropriate urges and drives. So you had to figure out what dreams meant. Carl Jung believed you had to figure out what symbols meant. So how is Jungian therapy used today? Well, Jungian therapy is an unusual modality of therapy. I wouldn't say it's popular. I wouldn't refer to it as unpopular either. It's really in the middle somewhere. And it's one of those therapeutic modalities that's really difficult to integrate with other modalities. It can be integrated with psychodynamic therapy, probably more easily than a lot of other therapies. But still, it has some features that are so different than mainstream modalities that it's really tough to weave in. It's a clever modality. It's abstract. There's a lot of philosophy in it. It's interesting. I think for a number of clients, they can really connect with the collective unconscious, the idea of archetypes. There's a religious spiritual and mystical component we see with analytic psychology. There's a lot of fantasy and creativity as well involved in it. And I think that certain clients really just connect with the items, with the elements we see in analytic theory. Again, it is a clever theory, very complex. It's not really, however, for everybody. I think that because it's so abstract and philosophical, that it can be difficult to make it concrete enough to apply to mental health disorders. I view Jungian therapy as more useful for exploring values and figuring out purpose in life, kind of like existential theory. Not really a theory that you would use to address directly a mental health disorder like depression or anxiety, but rather a theory that we'd use to understand our meaning and purpose our freedom and responsibility in life. Carl Jung did view pretty much all symptoms as having a useful component, even depression and anxiety, which cause a lot of suffering. He believed were there because the ego was trying to communicate with the individual, trying to tell an individual that something was off in their life. We now know, of course, that depression and anxiety have a biological basis as well as an environmental basis. So viewing them as just some sort of dysregulation with how somebody's living their life really isn't accurate. But I can see that Jung touched on areas that we could bring in to therapy as we know it now. Certainly some symptoms are indications that changes need to be made in one's life. Now with Jungian therapy being difficult to integrate in with other therapies, that doesn't mean that it can't be used as a standalone. And it doesn't mean it can't be integrated at all. As a standalone therapy, it is used. There are licensed clinicians out there that just practice Jungian therapy. And there are some that try to integrate it in, and they've had varying degrees of success. I view this as a fairly challenging therapy to apply, but a fascinating therapy to study. And I think that we can get a lot of information from analytic psychology that can be useful in a daily practice. 
it's just hard to imagine it being practiced as it was designed on a regular basis. I hope you found this description of analytic psychology to be interesting. Thanks for watching.